Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Kelly and I'm Executive Director of Family Caregiver Alliance in San Francisco. Family Caregiver Alliance has been around for over 40 years and our mission is to improve the lives of family caregivers and for whom they provide care through uh, emotional support, practical uh, information and, um, and advice, uh, as well as specific services to help families along their caregiver, uh, caregiving journey, wherever they may be. I'm so pleased today to um, uh, talk about or lead the discussion uh, around this very important and powerful um, video. It was a, a, a story of three families in Detroit who have taken on the many, many roles of family caregiving and how they are coping and how they're coping with the help of uh, Dr. Paula Dern, I might add. We wish we had, we could clone you and put you in every community uh, to be sure. Uh, it's, a, it's just a wonderful and powerful series of stories. And I'm a firm believer that stories are really the best teachers about the lived experience. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna now uh, introduce the panelists, our three panelists, two of which were in the film. And the first one is Roger Young, and you saw him. He was a care, uh, family caregiver who cares for his mother, Lillian, who has dementia, and he has become an advocate for uh, caregiving. And you can add that, Roger, to your many roles uh, that you uh, have uh, uh, assembled during, uh, during this period. Dr. Paula Duran is the director of Universal Dementia Caregivers. Her caregiving experiences resulted in a, a creation of a research-based positive psychology training approach, which honors both the care recipient and the caregiver. Universal care, uh, Dementia Caregivers prepares caregivers with strategies to engage the hearts and spirits of those living with dementia in need-based communities while caring for the caregiver. She's a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and she's also a Leadership Detroit graduate. Norelle Wheeler has uh, joined Family Caregiver Alliance uh, after completing a dual master's degree program in public health and behavioral health science. She has over 20 years experience, both personal and professional, in the field of caregiving and public health. Her free time is spent reading the latest on neuroscience, painting and writing, spending quality time with family and friends, discovering her ancestry and traveling. And I welcome all three of you to this panel discussion today. And thank you very much for uh, participating. I'd like to start off with um, how um, uh, caregivers strike a balance between all of the different roles that they have to take on. And uh, on behalf of the person, you're doing a lot of the, um, the life work as well as the direct care assistance, but you also need to take time and take care of yourself. I'd like to know um, how you make those balance and make some time and create some opportunities for self-care for you as a caregiver. And I'd like to start out with um, asking this question to, to Roger. How do, you, how do you find that you can balance um, the, the multiple responsibilities while also taking care of Roger? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, taking care of my mother from these last seven and a half years, yes, it's a great responsibility. And it causes uh, you to give up a lot of your time um, and a lot of you, as I first stated in the video. But there are times when you need to take care of you to be a better caregiver to them. And what I've learned to do is on her down times when she's taken care of and she's settled, then I tend to look after myself, whether it's uh, bathing and showering and fixing myself up, whether it's meditating or reading and stuff. Um, my mother right now is at a place where she just stays in one position. So she doesn't get up and go to the door or 
or anything like that. So there's times once or twice a week where I can get out and do some things like in the neighborhood, not far, but in the neighborhood where I know that she's okay until I come right back. Um, so those are just things that I find uh, that I can do for myself, watch a movie, read a book. Um, I'm also involved in other uh, training and research. So it gives me time to uh, get on Zoom for that. So I've been learning to uh, to make time for myself. It was difficult at first, but these last, especially during the ban- pandemic, the pandemic has really been good to me as far as being able to do some stuff for myself because we have the uh, Zoom thing and we have things that you can do online and through virtual. And those are my downtime for me. That's great. Um, uh, Dr. Duren, how, how do you um, know uh, when you're talking with caregivers that they're really heading for burnout? First of all, thank you for the invitation to be part of this important conversation. Uh, in terms of paying attention, um, there are lots of things you can attend to. Oftentimes we hear from caregivers when they are in need uh, or when they're in distress. It's usually when they present themselves to us first. What we try to do is get people to become part of the community where we can care for each other on an ongoing basis. But you might see them being extremely frustrated with their loved one, um, angry that other family members won't help. Uh, you might experience them uh, that in terms of being close to burnout, um, even sometimes withdrawing. I had one caregiver call me and said, I'm just leaving. And I'm like, what do you mean you're leaving? Well, I'm leaving here. I can't stand this anymore. But you can experience the level of anxiety that they're feeling, uh, the lack of hope that some of them might be feeling, in addition to the stress, or, or might be some indicators. And I tell caregivers when we train them, pay attention to your stress levels, pay attention to how you're engaging other people in terms of socializing, pay attention to any number of other indicators that would suggest I need some help. And I always stress, Catholic Kathy, that it's okay to ask for help. Yes. Definitely. Um, Norrell, uh, you do a lot of, uh, you know, you work with family caregivers every day. Um, and there's always a conflict of taking a little bit of time for yourself because they feel it's uh, selfish for them to, you know, really take time for themselves. How, you know, how do you talk to families about that? Um, I first say, you know, try to understand what it means to, you know, take care of yourself or, you know, to understand exactly what is self-care. Um, oftentimes, you know, I'll talk to caregivers who are experiencing a lot of, you know, what we call like caregiver guilt, um, you know, and sometimes they don't understand even where that guilt is coming from. So what I try to help them understand is, you know, um, you know, understand that as a caregiver, we carry a lot of, you know, um, underserved guilt or, you know, believing that sometimes, you know, the caregiver believes they're not doing enough. So, um, you know, understand where that's coming from. You know, you know, we talk about, you know, is it, you know, resentment for personal time loss? Maybe they, they need to understand that it's, it's normal to feel that like you're missing out on something because you've stepped into this role of caregiving. Um, perhaps there is some pre-existing unresolved issues. It's, it's, okay to have feelings around guilt and, you know, centered around unresolved issues that you have. Sometimes I find that caregivers are comparing themselves to others. And it's really about letting them understand that your caregiving cannot be compared to the next caregiver because your situation, your resources, your community is going to look different than somebody else's. Um, And just, you know, you know, dealing with our own personal issues. So caregivers, you know, maybe dealing with per- their own personal health, health issues or problems, you know, in other areas of life. And they need to be able to understand that that is that that's normal. Um, as far as a feeling of guilt, um, you know, I try to help them think of ways that are going to be personalized as far as coping with the caregiver's guilt. And so oftentimes, we, you know, talk about, you know, just acknowledging the guilt and what works for them through that acknowledgement? Is it that you talk to me as a family consultant? Is it, you know, one step higher, meaning you meet with a counselor or a therapist, someone who really understands um, the impact caregiving and caregiver guilt is having on you? Um, You know, 
look at the big picture. You know, although a caregiver may be feeling, um, you know, a, immediate stress to a situation now, um, it won't last forever. So, you know, we talk about, you know, just exploring like the sacrifices that they're making now and, you know, what the, what the long-term relationship is going to be with the person they're caring for as well as, their, as themselves when the person they're caring for is no longer there. Um, and lastly, I'll say, you know, accept that as a caregiver, we are not perfect. They are not perfect and that you, you, we make mistakes. So when caregivers can understand that they don't have to be perfect um, in the world of caregiving, then that too can um, help them, you know, cope with guilt and, and just anything that's, you know, that's bothering them in relation to being a, a, a caregiver. And, and yeah, like you said, Dr. Duran, it's about like, you know, them also making time for themselves. So, mm -hmm. and, and understanding that um, making time for yourself is, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. When we talk about um, the resources, uh, common tools and resources to ensure that caregivers uh, can get self-care, can take some time out for themselves, there's, um, there's strategies that you can do that in some downtime, as Roger talked about, there might be a little bit of quiet period there where he can go off and, and read a book and, and so on. And um, so I'd, I'd like to, to, you know, flip this to, to um, Dr. Duran and, and also to Roger about the other strategies of maybe using, you know, if there's services in the community or if there are other family members like daycare programs in particular, I'm thinking about, um, or if there are um, other strategies to get um, other family and friends involved in short periods of time where you might be able to go out and get some, take a walk or, you know, go have coffee with a friend. And so what are those kinds of strategies and how do you, um, how do you think about it and how do you talk about it in terms of using other resources? Dr. Duran. Great question. Part of, I just bounce it off of something that Noel said. Part of the issue is too many caregivers don't believe they deserve to be healthy. And so their life is an ongoing sacrifice that that's my job. That's the gift that's been, and we call it a gift to be a caregiver that's been laid at my doorstep. And I am going to fully give everything I have to the, to my loved one to ensure that they have a wonderful journey moving forward. First of all, caregivers have to understand in order to provide the kind of support your loved one needs, they need to be healthy. And, mm -hmm. and if we can get them to think about how important their own personal health. So we start with starting on dealing with what are those issues that are stopping my, this, this caregiver from not really believing that I deserve to be healthy. There, as you indicated, there are lots of resources, but part of the challenge sometimes with caregivers, they won't ask for help. And mm -hmm. part of that not asking for help is, I'm going to be very candid, we think no one's going to do it like us. <laughs> and in my mind, absolutely correct. No one will ever do it like us, but they can add value to your life and give you a time out. So helping them understand that others can help because sometimes people offer help. And then we sit there and watch them to make sure that they do everything right and correct just the way we do. And I step back and say, do we accept and honor that the person loves and respects my loved one that's being cared for? Can't they offer some things? And we have to allow the people to give what they can give. Because some of us are angry at our families. Uh, we serviced a, a family once and the dad was like, my daughter only wants to give me a, two hours a week to sit with her mother. And my response was, that sounds great. He's like, what do you mean it's great? I said, she could have offered you nothing. Now let's figure out how we use that two hours to our benefit. Right. So there are services, there are wonderful support groups. I encourage people to get into support groups that understand you and your, your uniquenesses and will be able to support you as you move forward. Respite is a wonderful option, but one of the ongoing challenges is sometimes we don't trust respite for a whole lot of different reasons. So we are constantly looking for respite organizations. I, and I have to say this very directly that I trust. And mm -hmm. those would be the ones that I would recommend if you're very confident. So respite support groups, um, you can build care, I mean, time for yourself in your day-to-day -day time. And what do people mean by that? People's like, well, I need to exercise. I'm like, great. Do you wash clothes every day? Abs no, I wash three times a week. Wonderful. That basket, when you pick it up, put some music in your head and, and make that basket part of the exercise routine. We show them how to integrate 
things into their daily activities mm -hmm. instead of it feeling like, oh, the task of going to exercise. So helping them to believe in themselves, helping, having them be willing to accept services, making the services such that people feel safe going to them and receiving them are just a few things off the top. And I'm sure Roger will add a lot more to that, uh, my, to that response. Thank you, um, Roger. Yes. How, how do you how do you ask for um, how do you ask for help or use other kinds of services to get respite or or do you? Um, yes, yes, I use a lot of services. Um, when it first started out, the first two years, I didn't know nothing about dementia. I didn't know nothing where to get help or anything. I did find a place where they had the adult services. I took my mother there so that I can get a little couple of hours, which mostly I just slept <laughs> because, you know, you hardly get any sleep. And then they connected me with how to look for different services that I came across Dr. Durant first. And when I connected with her, I it just opened up a whole new world of understanding dementia, a whole new world about the caregiving, the, um, the patient, um, resources, um, getting all your stuff in order. And from there, I went to, uh, I think U of M had a, a, a program, Wayne State University had a program. And then I just started researching and just connecting. And once you connect, sometimes they were connected with another connection. And every connection that they connect me with I took the opportunity to go. I never missed one research, one connection for help. Last summer, uh, I had a breakdown, I had a meltdown because it just, all this time just became, I don't have no help, you know, family-wise. Um, I went through six caregivers in less than a year. And so everything just became overwhelming. And so after this while, I had a breakdown, but then I started, seeking out counseling and therapy. And man, that that did a lot because it was for me. And I took out that time to, to do something for me and it helped me to find myself, to understand myself. Like they say, you have that guilt feeling. Um, your whole life is taken away. So yeah, you have a guilt feeling and then you feel anger because you have giving up everything of yourself. But my time of going to these different research, um, these, excuse me, these different organizations and support groups, those were my outings. Those were the only outings I had. But I did them. And I met a lot of good people. I've received so much help. And so that kept me balanced and grounded mm -hmm. and having a life for myself. I might not went out with friends or did other things, but these groups were my outing. Mm -hmm. And I met good people. I've learned a lot of things. And so I became a more confident mm -hmm. caregiver mm -hmm. and a more calm caregiver. Mm -hmm. There's still days, you know, you still have your frustrations and stuff, but I'm telling you, uh, I, I always talk to people and recommend them to get out and research go to support groups, go to anything that they have available to us because they are really out there. It's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I just always praise Dr. Duran because if it had not been for her, I probably would have been dead by now. Something I don't know, you know, because she opened the door and led me to so many things, even to things that making sure you got your paperwork lined up, mm -hmm. you know, um, attorney things, uh, finances and all of that, which helps you with being calm because those things are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, sometimes the paperwork is the most anxiety provoking of all. That's, that's really quite true. Um, Norell, we often um, talk about giving the caregiver permission to ask for help. Sometimes they just need to say, you need, you need to ask for help, you should be asking for help. On the same hand, um, 
there's also uh, a lot of uh, family and friends or neighbors who might want to help, but they don't know how. And so it's always good to have a plan about what that, you know, what you may need. Can you talk a little bit about um, the permission and, and really having some very specific tasks in mind for uh, fa how family and friends could help? Um, yeah, so there's, you know, I think first as the caregiver, it's there's this fine balance of understanding like what type of help you need. And so sometimes caregivers really have to take time either in the context of a support group or with, you know, a professional to really harness in on what those needs are. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know, I, I like to say, you know, once you know what those needs are and you as a caregiver know what you're good at and what you, you know, what you're able to handle, then you can know what to ask, where to ask for help. So for example, if you feel that you're really good at organization, you know, your, your cup of tea is, you know, organizing medications, making, scheduling the doctor's appointments, scheduling, you know, how many days per week they're going to, you know, an adult day program, et cetera. And you know that that's, that's what works for you, but maybe you're not so good at, you know, you know, you forget to set, take the trash out. You forget to return the plethora of phone calls of loved ones and family and friends wanting to check in on the person you're caregiving for. Then you can, you know, you know, ask for family and or friends that are available to come in and take care of the small task as, you know, taking out, out the garbage, the, things like that. The other thing too, is to um, also think of, you know, family and friends, what they're able to do and what, what they're not able to do and to create this list. And then sometimes it's as easy as just saying, you know, here's a checklist of things that need to be done where whatever you feel you can do, you feel most comfortable with, you know, sign up for it. Um, there's a few apps out there um, that, are, you know, that caregivers have found to be very resourceful, um, you know, I don't know if we can say what they are here, but there are apps out there where care, you know, loved ones and families can, can join in the, 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 the community effort of, of caring for, for a loved one. Um, and I think, you know, it also, this topic also ties into, you know, being prepared and, and, and not leading into caregiver burnout. Um, you know, if you're well prepared and you know who your your care team is, quote unquote, then um, you know self care comes easier. Um, you can access you know the resources that are out there, such as Roger has mentioned, um, and it, it makes caregiving much more manageable um, over time. But it is hard, you know, Kathy, when you know some some caregivers do not have family and friends to lean right. on. Correct. Yes, I I. We, we see a lot of that. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of conversation, always has been, uh, around how people identify as being a caregiver and because it's a natural role that you, uh, you know, would take on as a, a son or daughter or spouse or, you know, a good friend. Um, so this whole issue about how do you know you're a caregiver and if you identify as such. So I'm going to ask Roger, how did you know you were a caregiver to reach out for help? That this, this particular task at hand, with, did somebody tell you about services? Did you know, they speak to you as a caregiver? It's just a, it's kind of a chicken in the egg kind of question. Um, and we're always trying to uh, figure out what, what this might be, but um, you know, how, how people self-identify. Um, how, how did you realize that you were really going to become, it was it really when you were told your mother had uh, dementia? I just remember the scene in the car that all, that just so struck me. The first scene in the movie. <laughs> yes. Um, after uh, realizing that she wasn't doing things as normal, my sister and her car me saying something about the house and they lived there. I lived somewhere else and the house was going in foreclosure and I'm fighting. And then I had to move her with me because they left her. And as she moved with me and I started seeing a big decline and looking at her, that's when I had to start doing things for her. And once I did that, then I realized, okay, I have to take care of her. And like I said, for two years, I didn't know what to do. So I knew I had to become a caregiver because she could no longer do certain things. And then that's when I, I 
found out about Dr. Paula. And from that point, she guided me through, still through my life now, seven and a half years later, uh, because it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. Caregiving, um, you will always need resources. You will always need guidance. You will always need information. You will always need help. And so that's when I knew that I had to become a caregiver when I knew it was up to me to do the best I can to take care of her. And so I just put my foot out there and, and just went for it. Started, um, started researching what was out there. Yes. But then there's like now I'm a part of a worldwide dementia organization and it's more of a support group because sometimes the organizations can give you all the information and this and that, but then there's times, which I'm usually on the phone uh, in the middle of the night and we have this worldwide, like I said, worldwide organization. So we support each other. We tell each other the stories and what happens with them and how they handle it and what happens here and how they handle it. And that's something that I really, really love because it keeps you going. Mm -hmm. You know, it keeps you going from other people's stories, other right. people's experiences and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, somebody had to do it because they just left her. They just left yes. her in the house all along. <laughs> well, um, I'm, we're, our time is um, just about up. So I'm going to oh. give um, Dr. Duran sort of the last word on this. Um, and um, Dr. Duran, what would you say to people who are just starting out on a caregiving journey? I would say as a starting point, first of all, caregiving is, can be very rewarding. Most people think of caregiving as, uh, as hard work, and it is. Most people think of caregiving as, oh my God, I, I don't know what to do. It's crazy. And there will be moments like that. But there will be some gifts that you will be given that nobody else will give. And one of those for me was when my mother told me, I don't know your name, but I love your spirit. Mm -hmm. Those are gifts and you get those moments. I would say once you accept that you are a caregiver and most of us accept it when it's forced on us, some of us really plan it, but most of us don't. Look for help, get information, find a group of people that, that, that understand the issues and work with them. There are great resources at your Detroit area, ag the area of agencies, uh, various groups all over that are willing and are open to helping. Um, understand that this is going to impact your life more than you think it is. So if you think it's going to be tough, it will be tough, but it will also be what a gift to be given the, the permission to walk someone the last days of their lives. You know, that question could go on for, I could talk 20 minutes on that question, but the bottom line is it, accept that you are a caregiver. And then that dissonance that we feel inside, it starts to subside a bit and say that I'm gonna learn as much as I can and lots of stuff I don't know, lots of stuff I'll never know, but we will continue to connect with groups like yours and learn and read and more than anything else, honor the person. Honor them and know that they need you. I don't care how crazy your family is, we do a session on crazy family. It's a great discussion. Be willing, <laughs> be willing to be present and available to them and provide the support they need, they need, but honor your needs at the same time. Yeah, that's some um, great words of wisdom. And I love your uh, saying about the, the honor, the spirit of the person. Uh, because that that's the thing that they'll remember. And uh, just a just a, uh, a line that you said uh, that um, I'm sorry, um, one of the uh, the caregivers said that whose mother was in um, assisted living, and she uh, and I think you said the um, your voice is music to their ears, and I think that's just a wonderful way of framing the um, experience of maybe not being able to verbalize quite the way you used to, but understanding that that underlying emotional connection is always there. So that was a, a, a wonderful insight. We're at time now, um, and I'd love to thank all of our uh, panelists, uh, Roger and Dr. Duran, and um, also Norell uh, for joining us the, today to, to discuss this film. 
and um, and also to thank the producers, uh, Tighten It, for uh, producing this film. I think the power of stories uh, and understanding.